Good afternoon. We are very pleased to have you here in this room. And we have competition going on as we have many other rooms that they have multiple sessions as well. My pleasure today is to introduce that topic that will be presented by Dr. Daniel Hickey, Professor of Learning Sciences, Indiana University. His topic is Best of Both Worlds, Participatory Learning and Assessment in Competency-Based Context. I am very excited about the topic. I would like to learn more about our speaker. And that's why we will have introduction by Catherine Fulford, that she will tell much more about our speaker. Please, Catherine. I would like you all to um, invite you to all come up a little closer since we have kind of a small group. So for those of you in the back, that would be great. Um, Dr. Hickey, uh, by the way, just got his promotion to full professor, so yay! <laughs> uh, everybody knows what a hard trek that is. Um, he is all, uh, he's not only a professor, but he's a research scientist in the um, IU Center for Research on Learning and Technology. And he uses design-based research methods to study approaches to assessment, motivation, and accountability in technology-based learning environments, something that's important for all of us these days. Um, his current research, and this is really great, is supported by the MacArthur Foundation and Indiana University, and he's also ed led other projects um, supported by the U.S. National Science Foundation, Google, and the U.S. Department of Education. I'm going to have to ask you how you do that. <laughs> He's, of course, published numerous papers, and he's co-edited the New Frontiers in Formative Assessment, and he regularly blogs, if you want to um, look into his blog, at remediatingassessment.blogspot.com. Um, this presentation is exciting specifically for me because um, it will discuss the re-emerging area of competency-based education, something that we had a long time ago is now coming back as things seem to do, and sort of versus the uh, more popular constructivist approaches and, and perhaps how these approaches can be blended to create education that's more personal as well as provides new ways of assessing competencies for both stu um, students and teachers uh, about their success as well as for the accountability that we need. Okay. Thank you both very much for that introduction. Um, so I want to say thank you to everyone, Sarah Benson, for organizing the talk and for, for you for coming. And, and also thanks to the, to the volunteers and to the, um, to the, especially the people from Montreal. I think this is just one of the most lovely cities in North America. I'm really happy to be back here. Um, last night um, in the evening, I was able to enjoy two of my absolutely favorite fun things to do, and that is combining world-class biking trails and uh, world-class sculpture. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but the Parc René Levesque is just a gorgeous place, and these are just spectacular trails. Um, I'm heading out for a ride after the uh, poster session. If anybody wants to join me, I'm going to do about a 60K on the far side of the river tonight, so I'd love to have some company. So. So I'm going to talk about two things, two of my favorite things in the world of my work, and that is uh, participatory learning and assessment, these newer sort of ways of thinking about learning is 21st century, blah, 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 whatever. You guys know what we're talking about. It's this new sort of socially mediated network world that res respects th this amazing transformation in the way that knowledge is being uh, transformed and learned and accessed that has to do largely with media. Um, and then with competency-based learning. This is a, a pivot for me of a bit for about the past uh, two years, I'd say. Um, it's been around for quite some time. We're familiar with it. And um, uh, there's, there's it, it, a lot of, it, it really has seen this really strong, renewed interest, especially in higher education. Um, I do want to make a shout out to Google. I do also want to say, I said in the program that I was going to focus on the instantiation of this framework in Canvas. I decided to go ahead and show my work in Google Course Builder because we've succeeded in solving some of the really thorny problems of allowing participatory learning to occur in self-paced learning contexts. Uh, also thanks to IU and definitely to the MacArthur Foundation. So competency-based learning has this strong, it's an assembly line, right? You break it down into small parts, you very consistently put them together in a very structured way, um, and, and it has a lot of advantages. It makes relatively modest demands on instructor, 
uh, on instructors' knowledge of the disciplines, in some cases no demands at all when you look at the artificial tutors. Um, it's very, it's easy to be accountable. It tends to do very, very well in structured sort of comparisons with other alternatives. But, but many people resist it for various reasons. If you know your Volkswagens, you know that those VWs up in the left are 1952 VWs from that split back window. And that's, for many, many instantiations of competency-based learning, really go back to a behaviorist, if not traditional associationist views of learning. And that brings with it uh, some serious downsides for some people. They claim that you can't really get at higher order learning skills when you start from such basic levels. Um, alternatively, you have a whole constellation of approaches that loosely fall under the term constructivism. You got project-based learning, inquiry-based learning, a whole host of them. One thing all of these alternatives have in common is they're rooted in a set of assumptions about learning that are really antithetical to the associationist perspectives that most people associate with competency-based learning. Now, that has some advantages uh, for many. It, it's the only way you can really get at higher order thinking. They tend to be very motivating. They tend to be very personalized. But they have some serious downsides. Um, it's really difficult to do well. And it's extremely difficult to do well online. I think that uh, this notion of TPAC, this technological pedagogical content knowledge, in my experience, very few people who end up teaching online have enough of it to do constructivist instruction well. And certainly, it's almost impossible to do at scale. More importantly, these approaches, because they are rooted in antithetical views of knowing and learning, they don't get along very well. Many of the tensions that occur when trying to design instruction are the result of friction, often tacit, unacknowledged, often assigned to political reasons, when in fact it's just because they have two completely different and antithetical views of the way that individuals learn. Um, so in my work, I've been arguing now for, for a, a, my whole career that, that newer sort of situated and sociocultural theories of learning sort of offer a higher order synthesis in which we can reconcile these differences, in which we can take advantages of the strengths and minimize the weaknesses of these two approaches. Um, I outlined this in an article in JEMH uh, that was in 2012. I've really been doing this work in a series of studies dating back to my work at ETS in the Center for Performance Assessment around GenScope. I've had the pleasure of working with some of the, the leading uh, instructional innovators and along the way trying to build out this framework that I'm going to talk to you about today. Starting around 2009, I moved into teaching online and really began aggressively refining my own, my own online courses and that yielded the framework that I'm going to talk about today. Um, I, I present this work in a lot of different contexts. There's some papers in the Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference. Um, we've just published a paper in the journal uh, Educational Assessment that, that highlights that really if you're interested in the, the underlying theoretical assumptions behind the principles I'm going to talk about today, that's my most current articulation. But I've also been trying to reach much broader audiences, so I've been reporting like in Evolution and online journals and a piece coming out in Educause shortly that's really trying to, to make this approach, which is, is, is rooted in theories of learning that aren't familiar to a lot of people, much more accessible. But today I'm going to talk about my big open online course on educational assessment. This is a course I've been teaching for uh, a decade or so. Um, it's a book. I don't think we're ready for massive yet. We don't know how to do massive well. So my argument is, is that you need to go from small, get it working in a small scale, with an eye towards scalability, scale it up to big, and gradually streamline and automate features. And that's, that's how we got to where we're at today. Central to all of these projects is what I call a wikifolio. This is something that I introduced the first time I taught my assessment course online when I desperately tried and failed to use the ePortfolio subsystem within Sakai. Um, it just was terrible. It just didn't work. There were a lot of assumptions built in. The kind of participatory learning that I had in mind was impossible. And I literally dumped ePortfolios and introduced wikifolios in the middle of the course. And that's what's described in the JEMH paper. Um, what I'm going to show you today is an evolution. This is a much more sophisticated version of the Wikifolio that took advantage of the fact that Course Builder is only about 5,000 really clean lines of Python running on top of Google App Engine. So it's a really customizable, um, not a learning management system, but a course management system. You see there on the left, you can see the various pieces, those bars in gray open and close to reveal the instructions um, in black. You see on the right a ranking feature that I'm going to return to and a peer promotion and endorsement. This is this Wikifolio. The important thing is this is a public artifact in the class. Everybody can see what everybody's done. 
And when you insert the completed artifacts inside of a digital badge, you can show the world when you share your badge out. They can see all the work that you did in your class. Shout out to my just awesome team. Um, two people were really influential in this work. One is Jim G, the linguist, uh, who in uh, 2005, he was on my advisory board for really what was a failed effort to implement this model in elementary mathematics. Um, and it failed in the sense that unlike my other projects, I wasn't able to get these dramatically larger gains on classroom assessments and statistically larger gains on external achievement tests. And it was like, ah, Hickey, you, you, got, you, you got lucky with the other ones. You gotta have a theory of talk. You gotta find a way to get kids talking in productive ways about things that aren't interesting. And I spent three or four years working at it, and that really led me to Randy Engel's work, the late Randy Engel's work. Tragically died in 2012. Randy introduced this notion of productive disciplinary engagement. I'll return to PDE, but the most important thing I want to say is her four principles for fostering it, which really shaped my work and really are, are, are behind the principles I'm going to talk about today. First and foremost, you want to problematize content. This is not problem-based learning I'm talking about today. Problematizing learning means going from the perspective of the learner, not the expert. You want to open up issues that experts see as closed so that learners have a basis for engaging. You need a personally relevant context to do that. Um, once you've done that, you want to give students authority over their engagement. You want to avoid as much as possible any known answer questions in the learning space. You want to position your learners as stakeholders, as generators of knowledge. You want your learners to know more about the intersection of their own goals and context and the disciplinary knowledge you're introducing them to, them to than anyone else on the planet. Um, you want to teach them how to be accountable, walk the walk and talk the talk, defend your positions. And then finally, you have to give them the resources they need to do that effectively. So essentially what I've done in my work is combine an earlier framework that I've written extensively about called multi-level assessment. So I've basically folded Randy's uh, four principles into the first two principles in my model. And then those last three principles are this multi-level assessment uh, framework that I've been working on. I'm going to go back through all of these. There, that is the structure of my talk. But the first point I want to make here, and a point I hope you'll take away, is the distinction between four different contexts for disciplinary interaction. The first two principles are about public interaction. There's something really special that happens when people are interacting in the public and everybody, maybe not completely public, but certainly public in the class. So those first two principles are very specifically about ways of engaging people in an open space that other people can see. Once you've done that then, you set up a space for productive local interactions where individuals are interacting with each other or with the instructor in public also has some very special and unique affordances. Those are still very different though uh, than uh, private. So the assessment in my space happens in private. And then finally, this comes out of Rogers Hall's distinctions. I've added a fourth distinction that reflects my own belief that achievement testing should be done discreetly, if at all. It should be very minimal, it shouldn't be intrusive, and it should never drive your curriculum. So let me just go back through these and, and show you what this looks like in practice in one of about 10 settings where this model, which I call part, uh, participatory learning and assessment, has been implemented. So the first principle is use public context to give meaning to knowledge tools. So rather than the sort of flipped classroom idea where you're searching for the perfect curricular tool to teach a concept to particular learners, you're flipping that relationship completely around and you're, you're saying you're treating the disciplinary knowledge or disciplinary resources as knowledge tools and you're asking learners, which of these tools is most useful in this particular context? Uh, the, 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 the pivot that I've made recently is, is framing this in terms of competencies. You want to focus more directly on competencies that are more contextual and more consequential, more soft, touchy-feely stuff, more important stuff, in my opinion. And then in doing that, you want to make sure that indirectly, when you engage people in developing those competencies, that they develop the more conventional procedural and factual competencies that are more easily measured. And you want to do that publicly and transparently. The way we do that in the assessment book is that just when you register for the course, in order to register for my course, you have to define a curricular aim. Now this introduces a big challenge for people. Some people really struggle with this. They don't understand the difference between the practices of teaching and the process of learning. And if you don't make that distinction and understand the difference between a curriculum and a curricular aim, you're never really going to learn how to do assessment well. So they draft this and they uh, do multiple choice items that say what their role and what their context are. This is inf information is all dumped into the first assignment. 
that they work on, on defining a curricular aim. That is literally the first assignment, where they go in and read a chapter in the textbook that explains what an accessible curricular aim looks like. Now, if you look at those competencies that I've listed there, and this is a, even within the three times I've implemented this course, I've continued to refine this framing. The first competency is productively discuss curricular aims and educational standards. To some people, that's not a competency because it's not measurable. I say no. Even though it's not measurable, it's certainly accessible, but it's certainly observable and interpretable. And then the last one, apply typical considerations for deciding what to assess is a more conventional, measurable competency. So when they complete their first assignment, they go in, they, they, they click on the wiki folder, they get a standard editor, they define their role, they define their setting, they define their instructional context, and they go back and they further elaborate on their curricular aim and they engage with the first chapter doing this. If you take a look at the bottom there, there are four things in this textbook. That, this is Jim Popham's text. I think it's great. Um, these are what to assess considerations. This is a little hard for some people, especially people who are new to learning, um, maybe just instructing. And literally, in this particular course, the way you engage with this is you drag those descriptions in the order of what you think they are most relevant, and then you provide a rationale for that ranking. This turns out to be a really simple way to engage people in disciplinary knowledge. You just say, which one of these is most relevant? Most importantly, someone who's struggling with this assignment can look and see what someone else did and come up with their own justification. So it's a very good way of getting people engaged. And we do this over and over again. Students don't get bored with it. They like it. They know exactly how they're supposed to engage with the content. What we change every week is the content. The second PLA principle is product, uh, publicly support and reward productive disciplinary engagement. So to go back to Randy's work, disciplinary engagement from a situative perspective involves both the declarative knowledge, the facts and the concepts that you can measure, but also the more social knowledge, the practices, the cultural practices, the ways of being and the ways of doing and the ways of interacting that disciplinary experts demonstrate. Productive disciplinary engagement is the forms of engagement that creates lots of ties between knowledge and practices in a learning context, right? So you want, again, you want your learners to know more about the connections between their own professional practices, whatever they are, and the disciplinary knowledge you want them to learn. Um, you want to publicly support PDE so they can be informally rewarded. Never grade it. And don't require it. Make it optional. But convince your students that if they engage this way, they're going to learn the stuff that they're going to be tested on. So first, uh, you are instructed, each week you post a wiki folio, you're instructed but not required to interact with your peers. You want to post a question, say, hey, here's a question that came to my mind, and then you want to discuss. Just make threaded comments directly on people's wiki folios. This is another very important point. No discussion forums. Only use discussion forums for housekeeping. That allows discourse to stray and go off in abstractions that are often incredibly difficult to engage in, particularly for struggling learners. Instead, have all of the commenting occur directly on student-generated artifacts. And here you see one example of a kind of question that somebody asked in the first week of the course. And, and there's a response from someone. And this is kind of what it looks like. We get really, really good disciplinary interaction around the comments. Uh, I mentioned this earlier. So, Students are instructed but not required to endorse at least three of their peers each week for being complete. Not good or bad, just did they do what they were told to do. And they are instructed but not required to endorse one and only one person each week for being exemplary. And in order to promote someone, you have to provide a warrant for what was exemplary about it. So there's additional disciplinary engagement. This is not peer assessment. I now apparently have been widely quoted for something I said at, at the first Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference. Peer assessment sucks. Nobody likes it. It makes everybody nervous. It just gets in the way. Don't do it. This is not peer assessment. Now, one of the ways that we reward is we provide feedback. We provide each week this participatory feedback where we say, who got the most promotions in each of the networking groups? Which of your peers' work was deemed most exemplary? And, and here's what we say about it. It turns out students really like it when the instructor, this is where I put my time, this is right now 
fairly laborious. In fact, this is where my graduate assistant puts his time. This is the kind of stuff that we're automating right now and having a lot of progress with. But students want to see that, you know, that their work gets, gets pointed to this way. They read this stuff. And then we sneak in something really important. How many of you know the difference between content, construct, and criterion validity? Okay, this is a really complex concept to, to get across because um, w w it turns out that in my past classes, I've been happy if my, instruct if my students, based on the summative assessments, I'd say maybe half of them, I'd say, yeah, they understand the difference between reliability and validity. And maybe a quarter of them knew the difference between the three primary types of validity evidence. Let me just walk you through. This is what I call participatory feedback. So criterion-related validity has to do with whether or not people, whether your criterion are set at the right level. Is the student ready to advance to the next grade in the way that many administrators would be concerned with? Content validity is whether or not the assessment is valid relative to the content of the instruction. Not surprisingly, more teachers choose content-related evidence of validity as most relevant to their curricular aim. And then finally, construct-related validity evidence has to do with psychological constructs. And when all of a sudden the administrators and the teachers realize that those weirdo researchers who are studying stuff like self-efficacy chose construct-related validity evidence, all of them have a much better picture of these different types of validity evidence. So let me ask you now, how many of you understand the difference between the three types of validity evidence? That's what I'm talking about. This just happens over and over again where you use the difference between people's professional roles to unpack important, otherwise complex and potentially nuanced aspects of disciplinary knowledge. Another way that we, uh, we reward is with digital badges. I'm very involved in the digital badges work. I'll talk about it a little bit at the end. When you complete my course, you get that badge up there on the right and you can share it out to Facebook, and when somebody clicks on it, this is the page that they're going to see. This is a real badge, and if you clicked on one of your peers' Facebook badges, this is what they'd see, extensive information about what they had to do to earn that badge, including earn three badges that are embedded in that badge. And each of those badges, oh, by the way, see where it says leader? You earn the leader version if you get more of the peer promotions than anyone else in your networking group. Now, when you click on each of the badges that someone earned to get that final badge. This is the evidence that it shows. Again, you can see here the very first competency is productively discuss classroom assessment policies with professional peers, as evidenced by the number and nature of comments on the wiki folios. Whereas the last one is recognize appropriate uses of assessments in school, as evidenced by the exam score. This is the bottom half of that page. So there you can see the work that they did, you can see their exam score, and if you click on any of those chapters, you go to their Wikifolio. You see exactly all the work they did. You can see the content of the promotions that their peers gave for them. This is the key with digital badges. They need to contain claims and evidence. Anything you take away from today, it's don't issue badges if you can't pack them full of evidence. And there you see how easy it is. Literally, the earner of that badge just clicks once on those buttons on the right and shares their badges out. Uh, it's a really good way, by the way, to drive traffic to your courses because there's a little, little box at the bottom that says, if you're interested, put your email address. Many of the students in our book currently learned about the book because their professional peers completed it and shared their badges, and then they, that's how they reached us. My third principle is uh, grade artifacts through local reflections. Um, don't grade artifacts. Just don't do it. Don't try to ascertain whether or not someone has met a comp uh, knows something based on something they did. Now, if you want to say that the competency is that they're going to create this thing, well, then that artifact is fine. But that's not usually what we have competencies for. We're usually trying to make different kinds of claims. Um, when you do that, you create a dynamic that's very problematic that many, many people in e-portfolio settings acknowledge happens. It's called, is this what you want? Did I do it right? Because if I don't get all my points for this thing, it's because you didn't give clear enough instructions and you didn't give enough individualized feedback to the work I'm doing. Portfolio type assessment is incredibly laborious and you really often only end up with evidence of what someone did, which tells you how clear the instructions were and how much feedback they got. Instead, what we do is we evaluate the artifacts through reflections. This builds on Melissa Grisalfi's research, um, critical engagement, right? So when a math teacher says, 
I don't know, this portfolio assessment stuff was really hard to apply in my class. I just don't see how it would work. But when I looked at the work that those English teachers were doing, well, they're already doing portfolio assessment. The person learns something really useful about portfolio assessment. But more importantly, by reading that reflection, I can say, yeah, sure, I can tell you engaged. Um, consequential engagement is, you know, who did you interact with? Who did you learn from? And then con uh, collaborative engagement and consequential engagement is, what are you going to do differently in the future? So you don't have time to read this, but, but, but this is very clearly articulated what the expectations are. And there you see an example of one of them, fairly typical. When I grade my four credit students in my open and my conventional courses, all their points for Wikifolios are given to them as long as they post on time and as long as their reflection is coherent. It takes me 30 seconds. I literally cut and paste the feedback and give them all their points. I spend all my time interacting with them in more productive ways, and I don't waste a whole bunch of time in individualized private interactions with people that are really just arguments for extra points and often are not formative in any meaningful way. Uh, my fourth principle is let individuals assess their understanding privately. Assessment shouldn't happen. Formal assessment shouldn't happen in public. People need private opportunities to go in and say, okay, I think I've engaged enough. I think I'm ready to move on to the next assignment. Let me make sure. So we just give them open-ended performance assessments and essay items that they are instructed to complete from memory that tell them, look, if you miss more than one item on this thing, you're not going to do very well on the formal timed exam at the end of this module. However, reflecting my situative theories of, of, of assessment and my, my utter lack of belief in many formative assessment practices, we don't give them feedback on those items. They've already learned the right answer to that item by reviewing it. Instead, we say, go back, engage with your peers some more. Go back and find your classmates whose work was marked exemplary and go talk to them about what they did and interact with them. So, you want to use it to, to sort of re-engage rather than remediate. But you also, because you want to remind them, look, you only took nine items. There's a lot more stuff covered in this thing, and a lot more stuff is going to be covered on the final exam. This is this, in my earlier work, I talk about aligning informal, semi-formal, and formal assessment. Your informal observations, semi-formal classroom assessments, and formal achievement tests. Right now, we're in the middle of that space. And this just looks like this. I mean, you, this is nothing fancy. You can do this in any online quizzing system. Finally, measure achievement discreetly. Um, I did my postdoc at ETS. I studied with Jim Pellegrino. Um, I characterize myself as a recovering psychometrician. Um, I really have learned how to assess and measure stuff, or a born-again situative theorist, sometimes both things. Um, there's a time and a place for a good standards-oriented assessment tests. Right, the multi multiple choice tests with lots of items that are aligned to external standards that are independent of the way the curriculum was structured. If you want to measure gains from a pretest, if you want to compare different kinds of instruction targeting the same standards, and if you want to document your improvement as an instructor, the only way you can do it is with what I call distal standards-oriented achievement test. Because the problem, and I've written about this a lot, is, is that with your classroom assessments, you're constantly aligning your instruction with your classroom assessments. So you never really know how much of the improvement in your classroom assessments are what the validity theorist Sam Messick called construct irrelevant easiness. Right, you're, 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 when you're teaching to the test, so to speak. It's a very, very difficult and challenging problem. You have to have something that is not being used to align to the curriculum. So. For the students, their primary function is to motivate prior engagement. We just completed the test in my class, and this is probably the most difficult part about this approach, because my tests, I aim for a mean of about 85%, and maybe one or two students tops getting perfect scores. That's a good distribution. I use item analysis to make sure that the items are working. To do a good achievement test, you have to have best answer items. Not right answer, but best answer items. Those are the ones that are going to discriminate between people who know a lot. Now, students push back on this. I just went through this with my class. They said, eh, there could have, you know, I, I can see why two answers were plausible. Well, it turns out the only people who consistently pick the more plausible answer got all of the other items right. And that's what item analysis does. So, um, it, it, you just basically convince them, look, this item, this exam's, on, I'm literally in the middle of this in my class, this exam was only worth 10 points. So the average score of 85% mean you lost 1.5 points out of 100. Stop it. Don't worry about it. And that's what I mean by discrete achievement testing. 
you want to refine your test, but you don't want to teach to them. You should not know what's on these distal measures. You shouldn't be closely aligning them. You should be targeting standards, not curriculum. You want to protect test security. You want to, you don't, don't give them item level feedback. Just give them feedback on the whole thing, right? How many of you deal with exam proctoring? It's a nightmare in online. I mean, my university's going through, they're putting cameras on kids and kids look away and ugh, it's a nightmare. Instead, just use, include enough items that are best answer items that are impossible to look up and that the only students who are gonna get them right when you give maybe three minutes per item are students that have been engaging in class. And then assume that some students who feel like they've done very well still might get them wrong and convince them to be okay with that. And give them, yeah, three or four minutes per item is about the right amount of time for those kinds of items. So how do we do? Um, this is the 2013 data where we had, a, uh, we started with 400 students registered, 160 completed the first assignment, 60 completed the class, including a dozen that decided to enroll for formal university credit. Those are the achievement scores on an exam of the sort that I just described. Um, you can see the students who took it uh, for credit mostly did better. In terms of engagement, we just get really tremendous levels of engagement. And those are the average words per wiki folio. You can see that even in green, the, the people that eventually dropped the class, the 100 or so students who started the class but didn't finish it, even they are writing around 1,000 words a week. And this is all some pretty solid writing. This is all disciplinary, individual disciplinary engagement. In terms of their social engagement, you can see there that the, again, these are mostly open students. You can see the blue lines, the lighter lines are the, four the dozen four credit students. We're averaging around oh, six uh, endorsements, right? They're instructed but not required to do three. We're averaging six. Um, we're averaging around five comments a week. These comments tend to be around 100 words. They tend to be very in-depth, threaded discussions, not a lot of, that's nice. And my favorite line is the orange one at the very bottom. You can see that as the class finished, that 80% of the people were engaging in this peer promotion activity. Um, really, there was a handful of foreign students. It was clear that one university in the Middle East had assigned all their instructors to complete our course. And they were the vast majority of the ones who were sort of phoning it in and not, not sort of engaging uh, at the level of the other students. When we coded the comments, right, this is, what I'm after here is productive disciplinary engagement. I want them talking about the assignment. So w if we gave them a three if they're talking about the assignment, the chapter, right? So like 90% of the comments are on topic. Very, very few comments stray off into abstraction and very few comments say that's nice. So the thing that I really like is that over, around half of the comments were coded as referencing a context. So they weren't talking about these things in the abstract. They were referencing either the Wikifolio owner's context or their own professional context. Uh, one of the interesting things we found in 2014 was that requiring students to post a question, right, so they couldn't, they couldn't uh, post their Wikifolio without putting a question to their peers, it cut the contextualization level in half to 25%. Because people were asking questions when they didn't really have a good question to ask, and it was taking it away from the context. So that's the kind of stuff we're looking at. So that's what I mean by participatory learning and assessment. Um, we're, we have this running in Canvas. To do, uh, how many of you use the Canvas learning management system? Yeah. Anybody work for Instructure? How many of you have discovered the bolt-ons? There's a whole bunch of features in Canvas that don't really work, badges for starters. Yeah, they bolted them on, it was a marketing ploy. The learning analytics, not there yet. Uh, it's the only learning management system I have ever seen that doesn't allow threaded comments on student-generated artifacts. It's insane. So the way we're doing it right now in my current course is every Wikifolio is simply a new discussion page. It works pretty well. Um, this is what I'm really excited about, though. The reason I showed this date instead of Canvas is we haven't gotten this working in Canvas. And that is, is that the book is now self-paced. We have finally succeeded. I've been dreaming about this for five years of fostering participatory learning in a self-paced context because in both my courses as well as the, the Indiana University high school courses where we have implemented this pretty widely, um, these tight deadlines are problematic. People like online courses because they're flexible, they can work ahead, they can work behind, they can work at their own pace. And so the holy grail for me in my research is allowing this kind of participatory interactive learning to occur when people are working at their own pace. So 
we don't have funding for, well, we do have funding for this, not, for, not in the book, but so we just finished programming a couple of pieces that needed to happen to make this possible. The first is a way of saving a wiki folio that al alerts subsequent learners to whether or not you can interact with them. Right? So you've always been able to go in and look at previous students' work to get ideas, but now when you save it, the little green stars, when people see it, they, know, they say, oh, this person will probably email me back. So if you post a comment to a, to a prior student, the system sends them an email and a link and, and sends them back in to interact with them. Does it work? Yep. This is the interface. It's working. It's just beginning to work, and it's, I'm really excited about that. We, I, we definitely have... Can you just show us the picture? Yes. Like yes. There you see at the, at the lower right, this is my current class. This is the new interface. You can see the archive wiki folios, the one on the right. There's, I've got about seven or eight students who we emailed and said, hey, you know, do you guys want to, you know, do you, will you change your archive settings? Seven or eight of them changed their archive settings. We have a handful of students who are trying to finish before they go on vacation, so they're working ahead. And then a, a former st a, a student who came halfway. And they're going in, leaving comments. This is one of them. This is, uh, this is a 2014 student interacting, a 2015 student interacting with a 2014 student and that student coming back and interacting with them. Really exciting for me. Um, that's that work. Um, I'm doing a bunch of other stuff. We have succeeded in enacting this approach in uh, Indiana University High School. It's one of the largest high school, online high schools in the country. Um, we have NCAA accreditation. Most places don't. That's really important right now. So we have about 3,000 students. Mostly really conventional distance education, but they've invited us to use this model to transform their courses. So this is up and running in all of their English courses, and we now have a team transforming all of their social studies courses. Um, as I mentioned, I'm currently running a course on educational data sciences, a EDS book, in Canvas using discussions for Wikifolios. I've just gotten a grant, a small grant, to do some pilot work. We're going to make LTI compliant modules for pre-calculus and calculus using a self-paced model. Once we get enough students, we'll, we'll refine them in a formal class by saying, hey, all of you go do this. And once we get critical mass going, then we'll, we'll use, you know, a lot of teachers search for standards on the web. They just enter the complete text of the standards and we'll just dr drive traffic that way. Our goal in this work will be to have clusters of standards around, uh, in this case, um, the parametric equations, so that the badge that the students earn can be emailed to the teacher and the teacher just, there's no way they can't accept that badge as, as evidence, as credit for developing the competencies around the standards that are referenced in those badges. I'm just wrapping up open badges in higher, or I'm just wrapping up, uh, oh, I forgot to list it, design principles documentation project. I've just finished a two year study of the 30 projects that MacArthur funded in 2012 to use open digital badges. We have a piece coming out in Educause, I think next week called Where Badges Work Better. Um, my current project is uh, Open Badges in Higher Ed. We're funded for two years. We're halfway through that. If you're interested in using Open Badges, I've got an awesome team. We can help you for free. Um, and then finally, I'm, I'm, I'm helping lead an effort at the American Council on Education to develop uh, quality standards for um, uh, digital stackable credentials. So that's my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. The topic is enough complex, and many questions can come for, uh, from audience. We have at least 15 or 20 minutes, therefore no rush. And I will start to take, or you can take yourself, questions from audience. I'm not sure if everybody can hear in the back. Okay. So anyway, what we're trying to do is probably it's going to also come out as an LMS. 
but that specifically creates or collects analytics for competency-based systems. So we're looking for partners. Should, <laughs> should you be interested, we're gonna try to go for some money to do that. Yeah, the whole issue of, of the LMS you choose is really important. One of the bolt-ons in Canvas is competencies. The competencies are associated with courses rather than people. That's so that they could check that box against mostly the other LMSs. There, I had never met a single person who has used the competency subsystem in Canvas. Badges, liking, and uh, competencies were all features that were more or less bolted on Canvas. My university is leading the way with Canvas, though. We, how many of you have used Sakai? Does, does everyone understand why IU, which helped found Sakai, dumped Sakai? Well, it's a really, really important thing. I'm, 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 I don't know HTML, for starters. I'm not a coder at all. So I, my, some of my graduate students are. Some of them are very talented. Um, but I have learned not to code. Um, but when they, so when, um, Sakai became so bloated, no one knows how it, no one knew how it worked. Like I watched one ePortfolio company almost bankrupt itself trying to install ePortfolios in Sakai because it's such a convoluted, it's like Firefox, it's just this unbelievably messy piece of open source code. So they were faced with a very difficult decision. Either they had to rewrite it from the ground up and make it compliant with LTI. Learning technologies interoperability, which allows you to have a subsystem like ePortfolios, badges, content, outside of the LMS, so they really face the decision, either we rewrite Sakai in a clean piece of code that's LTI compliant, or we go out on the market and find one, and we put together a consortium so we can ne negotiate with them, and that's what IU and Michigan did. Unison is a $30 million, right? Those of you who know how hard it is to get money out of a university, well, there's 10 universities who have committed $3 million to the Unison consortium. They're negotiating with Canvas, my university is currently defining the data de definition dictionary for instructure for the learning analytics. So it's happening, um, and those features are emerging. Uh, a credit trust corporation, for instance, have now released their, their external app for open badges for Canvas. So the stuff's coming online, and it's, it's working. It's just going to take some time. And Badger, uh, Nate Otto, who is the newly appointed president of the Badge Alliance has just released the Badger app um, at GitHub. It's a standalone Django application that's LTI compliant for issuing badges. So it's all happening. Um, it's just, just be patient. Other questions? I do have a question also. At the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned about associations and perspectives. What that means? Okay. So, um, that's the core assumption that, that knowledge can and should be broken down into many small elements and can be aggregated back together into a meaningful whole. That is the, a core premise of behaviorist theory. Now what a lot of people, a lot of people make the distinction between behaviorism and cognitivism. And, and that's really not true because in the cognitive re revolution, there were a, a pretty major split happened. So you have the John, people following in the tradition of John Anderson Right. And a lot of this traces back to Pittsburgh. It depends on what side of Pittsburgh you were from. If you were from Carnegie Mellon and you bought into John Anderson's theories of learning, they replaced the if-then stimulus, uh, they replaced the stimulus response associations of behaviorism that were used to break knowledge down into little bits and build it back up with if-then cognitive associations. So they still believe in the associationist assumptions and the reductionist assumptions but from a cognitivist perspective. So all the work coming out of Carnegie Mellon, the cognitive tutors and stuff, are really breaking complex topics down. And that's why Carnegie Mellon has been so incredibly successful with their mathematics tutors, because mathematics is one discipline where you can break it down into its smaller elements and have what most experts would say is a pretty solid evidence of disciplinary knowledge. They're not using it in more you know, humanities or anything like that. So the, the, the point I was trying to make with all of that, though, is that that perspective, that the, it's a very antagonistic relationship between them. Because when, but, and it really goes back, it's a philosophical distinction. You're talking about the difference between the British empiricists, Hume and his friends, and Descartes, the, the continental rationalists. 
and, and it, right, so it, it really is rooted in, in fundamental philosophy of individual, of, of individual beings, but in, in terms of learning, it really is this very different assumption. If you, uh, the, a, a constructivist perspective doesn't believe in those associations. That's why they're so resistant to multiple choice tests because it's like, no, if you, if you think that learning is building and constructing higher order conceptual schema, that, that those little associations that people appear to have when you give them a multiple choice test, it's just problem solving, they're just constructing answers and they're doing it. So it's that fundamental tension between those two perspectives that in my opinion is behind a lot of the friction and a lot of lack of progress in education. And much of my work is shaped by Jim Greeno's arguments that if you push really hard on sociocultural perspectives, you get to the so-called situative synthesis, which says we're gonna use social learning as the primary way of thinking about learning and treat all individual learning as special cases of social learning. So that gets you out of that problem. That's the educational assessment article that I mentioned. That's the one that really, it's, it's a tough, it's a, it's, it's a really, really tough argument and much of my time now has been dodging that and, and finding ways to convince people to do this and try this approach without having to explain that because it's, uh, I have a lot of fun with reviewers. Other questions? Yeah, if, I hope more time. questions will come, I, I'm sure. But I usually don't allow, gra my, <laughs> I usually don't allow graduate students from my only teaching. Before more questions, questions will come, my next question would be, how this association-based approach is incorporated into your assessment? Well, you saw that there was a very conventional multiple choice achievement test that included items that got at very sort of reductionist competencies, right? So we're gonna give, let's say for example, this week, last week we did portfolio and performance assessment. So the first competency was um, discuss the advantages and disadvantages of portfolio and performance assessments with your peers, right? So I don't reduce that to like knowing it's really hard, don't, don't, don't do it. However, I do say that you will be able to recognize, um, uh, let me use a different example. I have a competency to say things like, you will recognize uh, inappropriate um, item formats or inappropriate uses of assessment. So we break those down into those smaller things because we know that we can present that as a very specific measurable competency. That's what I meant by focusing on the more consequential and contextual stuff. We don't ever really measure that. What we, the trick is that we measure the stuff that we want them to learn along the way. That's what I mean by aligning informal, semi-formal, and formal kinds of knowledge. Oh, um, sure. I'm Erin Riesland. I'm from Seattle University. Um, I really enjoyed listening to this. It's given me a lot to think about. Um, and uh, I come from a university, it's a Jesuit university, we're into very small classes. Um, and so I've been trying to convince uh, faculty and the administration that's okay um, to put courses online because you'll still have that participatory full Ignatian experience. So I was wondering, we talk a lot about teacher presence in the course itself. If you could talk a little bit about your philosophy on that. So um, one of the things I do like about this approach is it doesn't make huge demands on my time. I shouldn't teach two online. I've never taught two classes one semester. I've done that once in my career. And for some reason, going on vacation, going to conferences, I thought it would be good to teach two courses in this fashion. Um, I have TAs assigned and they can really help. Here's the key though, is what I do is I go in and very uh, carefully, I get the early posters, Right, the people who post earlier, I reward them by going in and giving relatively detailed feedback to them. And then I point everybody else to it. So those, 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 we send out these announcements that say, hey, there's some really great interaction happening here. But here's a really key thing. I'll say two things about my role as an instructor in my two different courses I'm doing this summer. One is the assessment course that teaches itself. Right, it's, you know, I go in to, I mean, you know, I got 30 people who are paying 1400 bucks to take the course. They want their money's worth. But that's because my TA goes in and says, hey, you should really go in and comment on this stuff. I just don't have time to, to follow it all. 
and I don't. You know, we try to make sure that somebody gets a comment from somebody every week, but that's because you know they're paying for it. But um, clearly, people can go in there and engage, and they don't need uh, my expertise. Now, I did. I should say I added videos. I didn't have videos until in the 2013 version, and I resisted them because so often they're so they're really hard to make. It's really a lot of work. Then you can't change them when you want to. You look at them and go, oh my god, I can't believe I said that. Um, but also they reinforce, I mean, they're just lectures about lectures. It's just like, you know, a lot of these flipped classrooms and a lot of MOOCs are just, it's just this, this boring display. It's like professors talking to their computer and then saying stuff and giving counterexamples in their lectures that then appear as the foils in their multiple choice test. It's not, it's learning, but it's not very exciting. So the videos that I included I, I finally realized what I can do is I can go in and model the kinds of reasoning so it's easy in the assessment class because I say, in my assessment class, here's how I do it. In my doctoral seminars, I do it a little differently. So I model this kind of personalization. I say, you know, that yeah, construct validity is really, really relevant to me in my work because I'm focusing on constructs, but when I'm focusing on achievement, right, so I model that. So that gets, I think that gets a big chunk of that personalization. I'm not just going in and lecturing, I'm going in and, and I'm, I'm modeling the way that I want them to think. So that's, that's one element of it. But in the EDS book, um, one of the reasons that I really wanted to teach it, I've got a lot of pretty high profile people coming in, in in learning analytics as guest speakers, and I've been trying to convince them that we need to think hard about this approach. Um, I don't have a strong background in learning analytics, so what I was able to do was put together a course that is running very successfully without reading the articles. I only read the articles enough to structure that ranking thing. So George Siemens, or, or this week, uh, Philip Buckingham Shum, who did the keynote at Ed Media um, in Tampere, we just finished reading his brilliant piece where he talks about the dis a really complicated distinction between inherently social learning analytics and social learning analytics, right? I, it, it's, it's, it, it gets back to some of this epistemological stuff, right? So, so I knew I wanted to figure out what he was talking about, but I was able to set up a course and go in and do that. Uh, Simon came in and was the guest discussant this week, and he came in and gave some comments. I came in and I was indeed able to get this conversation happening. So there's a lot of very contextualized personal interaction. The third thing I want to add, though, is, is that what this allows me to do as an instructor is something that I think is really, really important about this approach. And that is, is that I'm able to embed the more nuanced, abstract stuff in the context of the comments. So for example, this last week in the EDS book, I didn't, I didn't try to build into the assignment this distinction between inherently social learning analytics and social learning analytics. I just knew it would come up. So if you put that in the text of the assignment, you're gonna overwhelm your less experienced, the real learners, right? In every class, you've got these people who aren't learners at all. They're the really knowledgeable, really experienced ones who bring a strong background, and they're just learning new names for stuff they already understand. What they really often end up doing is interacting with the instructor, taking the discourse up to a level which is too abstract and too nuanced for the real learners to participate in. So you're really trying to fight that tendency by waiting for the students. So we tell the student, we wait for the students to, to begin their assignment. They've begun their Wikifolio. They're struggling trying to decide whether inherently social learning analytics and social learning analytics is more relevant to them. Then they can go in and look at the discussion that I've added to another student's Wikifolio in that same context. And what would have otherwise completely overwhelmed the students and, and made them mad and, and right they can go in and get that information in the context at the time and in the way that's more meaningful to them. Importantly, though, they can choose not to, right? You know, I don't, I, 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 it's, not a real, it's not a competency in this particular course, but it's a really important thing for them to learn. That, um, by the way, we're working with um, St. Norbert's College in Minnesota. It's a Norbertine college. I don't know the difference between Norbertine and Jesuit, but I know it's an important one. I think there's been some wars fought over it, but um, they're one of the projects we're working with in the Open Badges in Higher Ed project, and to give you an example of why I get excited about competencies, they want to give these badges for um, co-curricular learning outcomes. Badges are really good at getting at the stuff that doesn't end up in the curriculum, so they're going to have a, a physical pin, a fleur-de-lis that, that, that you will get pinned on at graduation if you develop 
if you, if you develop evidence of these four competencies. One of them is spirituality, because it's a Norbertine college. And the really exciting discussions that are happening is basically saying, like, you probably don't want to frame that evidence in terms of competency. Spirituality isn't something that you're competent in. Rather, you want to give them opportunities to provide evidence that you have engaged in spiritual practices. That's the kind of stuff that lends itself really well to badges. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, we're, we're, there was a meeting, Granny Bass uh, at Georgetown had a big meeting last week, and my project coordinator, James, went there, and they ha we have a nice little subgroup of people that are literally talking about badges in a humanities context and competencies and stuff like that. Okay? Okay, then we have to thank our speaker, Dr. Hickey, for such a nice presentation. <laughs>